Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. I'm back for another Acoustician Reacts video. In this case, I'm going to react to Eric Valentine talking us through the build out of his new studio. Now, people have been asking me to look at this video series for some time now, and so that's what I'm going to do now. Uh, let me, though, preface this video by saying a few things. First of all, obviously, massive thanks to Eric Valentine for putting all this info out there, for putting all this work into experimenting and documenting all those experiments uh, with his room. I mean, it's such an effort. I know how much time and effort that takes. So massive thanks to Eric Valentine for doing this. And also just congrats, Eric, on finding a solution that works for your room after all this uh, effort involved. Uh, thankfully, you got to a result that works for you. I think that's the most important part about this. Now, I didn't watch all the videos in his series. There are a couple that he did, a few actually on tuning his room, building out his room. So we're only going to look at the last one, as far as I can tell, uh, that uh, that is called The End of the Acoustic Rainbow. It's quite a long video, so I'm going to skip through a few things in order to keep my video as brief as possible. It's still going to be on the long side, I imagine. And obviously, if you want to watch Eric's original videos, I'm going to link to both his channel and this particular video that I'm going to be reacting to in the description, so you can check that out for yourself. Now, the next thing is that if you're kind of seeing this as a guide for you to follow, you got to understand that this isn't a typical home studio, right? So Eric's room is very large. It's got very high ceilings. And the process that he went through really involves a lot of experiments that you really don't have to take to go through in order for you to treat your room. There are more direct ways to get to a result. And those are obviously the things that I teach here on my channel. So just don't think that you need to follow his exact path in order for you to get to a solution in your home studio. Also, I'm not going to do any bashing in this video. That's not my style. Quite the contrary. I think it's really amazing that Eric took us on this journey with him. It's really, really amazing that we get to follow along and learn from his mistakes. As you'll see, he found out the hard way a lot of the things that I keep repeating here on this channel. So you're not going to find me bashing anything that he did here at all. Now, one thing that I do have to say outright is that Eric used a lot of tube traps for the low end treatment in his video. And I have my personal opinion about tube traps. I don't think that they are the best solution for absorbing bass. In my opinion, they are literally just round versions of a standard panel. If you, if you get a panel, a standard square panel with the same material depth as a tube trap, you'll get the same, if not better results, because actually you're, you're getting more surface area at that particular depth than with a tube trap. And so usually the results are the same, if not better. There's really nothing special about the functionality of tube traps. Although they do work, obviously, yeah, so again, this isn't me bashing Eric's approach. Eric obviously found a preference for tube traps at some point, and, uh, and that's great. If it works for him, that's amazing. U ultimately, that's what I want, right, for people to actually have results in their rooms. And of course, if you want to know more about what I think about low-end treatment in general, all the different types of bass traps and low-end control types, mechanisms, panels, whatever you want to call them out there, then you can download my complete guide to bass traps and bass trapping at the link in the description. It's completely free. It's basically kind of a summary and an encyclopedia of sorts of all the different types of bass traps out there, both off the shelf products and DIY solutions, combined solutions. So it's all in there, porous absorber bass traps, tube traps, resonance absorbers, so helm halts, and membrane traps and combined versions of those active traps. They're all in there nicely laid out so you can kind of figure out how they work, how you can actually know when you're looking at different types of products online or build instructions, what it is you're actually doing, what it is you're aiming for, but also how to use them in your room, how many you would actually need to get results, where to place them, how to go about the process of figuring out where to place them. It's all in there nicely laid out for you to kind of get a, an overview and an understanding of 
what kind of low end control works best for you so that you can make an educated decision if you are trying to get more low end control in your studio. Yeah, so again, this is my complete guide to bass traps and bass trapping that you can download for free at the link in the description. So let's jump into this video with Eric Valentine, the end of the acoustic rainbow and see what he has to say and what he found works best in his studio. This is what I'm calling the end of the rainbow episode because I'm going to show the final stages of tuning the acoustics of this room. Um, man, am I happy with them. I've actually been working on these speakers and mixing on these speakers, recording on the speakers. Oh my God, it's good. Oh boy, it's good. Um, just even, you know, doing these live performance recordings in this room compared to what was captured at RCA and doing mixes, I'm A-being to the album versions and uh, being able to really hear so much more clearly what's going on um, just in the mid-range and everything. It's, it's really, oh boy. Amazing, yeah. Again, congrats, Eric. That's really what I want for anybody out there. So that's, that's really what you want from your system, right? It's, it's great. And so I'm super excited about it. So let's get into this. Um, so when I left off of the last one, uh, the last episode, I'd done the VPR panels. And you can still see some of those up there. Let's see if I can figure out. Yeah, so that's, those are the VPR panels on the wall there. Um, and, and I have to say that you know, what was described to me at the time, you know, when I was going to build these things was open window down to 60 hertz. They are not that. They're not that. Um, <laughs> it definitely, the VPR thing, having that resonant metal panel definitely extends, you know, the uh, absorption into a lower range. But, you know, if you really look at the graphs of um, what the company, that Renz company in, uh, uh, in Germany, what they're building, when you look at what they're doing, you know, down around 50, 60 hertz, it's actually tapered off. The absorption is tapered off quite a bit, you know. So it's only getting maybe 20, 30 percent of the energy um, that it's, that's, you know, uh, being presented with uh, down in that range. It's still absorbing some there, but not a whole lot. But, you know, when you're in the like 100 to 200 range, man, it's, it's grabbing, you know, most, most everything at that point. So that's been my experience as well. Yeah. So the, the experiments that I did with, uh, uh, Verbundplattenresonatoren, VPRs, compound baffle absorbers, sometimes called, uh, is exactly what he described here. Yeah? So um, if you actually want them to work in the very low end, uh, it's a whole other ball game, as always, and you really need to calculate these things, build them right. Um, and apart from that, if you just kind of, I didn't actually fully watch his episodes, so I'm not entirely sure what he did. Um, but um, with the, the, the results that I saw with experimenting with these is exactly what he just described. Yeah? So they work in the, they actually work kind of an upper bass and mid frequencies and they work, work very well for that. Um, but if you want uh, low frequency control with VPRs, um, that's uh, slightly trickier to do. I think there is some value there, but when, you know, ultimately I was, my vision was I'd put these things everywhere on the ceiling and all the walls and all over the place and I'll be done. My, my control room's going to sound great. Um, done deal. And uh, that didn't happen. <laughs> and so here we go. Let's no, pull up the graph. Let's see. Do I have the right version? I do. Okay. Um, so this is where I ended up, um, you know, on... Uh, with just the VPR panels um, on all surfaces of the room. And so when you're looking at this graph, you got to ignore this part because um, at a certain point I started doing graphs of both speakers and I have only one microphone. And if the distance of that microphone is a little bit different from one speaker to the other, then you get these cancellations in the high, high frequencies. And I, at this point, I'm really only concerned with this range. So I wasn't really uh, paying attention to this, and you shouldn't either. It it's really not like that. Uh, I couldn't have explained it any better. That's exactly the problem. That's why I don't measure both speakers at the same time. There's hardly any point in doing that. In my opinion, I always measure one speaker and then the other speaker. Uh, because of exactly what he just mentioned and what we're seeing here is if you mention uh, if you if you measure both speakers at the same time any slight offset of the microphone from the perfect center will give you these cancellations in the high end and i get 
emails with uh, with images like this all the time where people are asking me what's going on. Well, that's what's going on. Yeah, you just need to measure one speaker at a time, and then you don't get this uh, these drop offs in the high end. Um, so I still got some real stuff to figure out here, especially here, right? So this is whatever it is here. Um, 53 hertz, maybe, yeah, 52, 51 hertz, somewhere around there. Okay, so this stuff is averaging somewhere around minus 7, something like that. The bottom of this peak is like, you know, minus 23. So, you know, that's like a 15, 16 dB, you know, cut at this frequency. That's, that's pretty bad. Um, in fact, I'd say that's really bad. And you can really hear it, you know, when you're sitting in this seat. Uh, there's another one here, and so this is most likely that I, there's a, there's an acronym for it. There's um, speaker boundary interference. I, I can't remember. Everybody was mentioning it in comments. <laughs> I can't remember it, but uh, this is this issue, the back wall uh, to the speaker. Um, so that's right there. And then there's another one, which is sort of is some sort of harmonic of some of these other issues that are going on. It's uh, up here around whatever this is. Uh, 212 here. Let me move this one here. We can keep an eye on these these dips. And this one's about yeah 113, 113. The uh, you know so this one is probably a few dB less than that. So this has got like a good 12 dB. This is probably a good 10 dB. Um, you know these are some major major issues. And so um, just to sort of tease the the whole thing here. Um, so this is where I ended up. Uh, we can look at that. So that's the final thing. That's what it was. This is what I'm hearing now. Amazing result, yeah? I mean, that's kind of what you want, right? And this is still very typical, um, even with a sub substantial amount of treatment, that we're still seeing kind of fluctuations of kind of plus minus 3 dB or some something like that. You know, below 100 hertz, um, it's still very typical. And um, the probably more importantly, uh, because there's a little bit of EQ going on here. Haha, yeah. So there you go. Even with all that effort and touch up with EQ is still worth it. Yeah. So that's why I don't oppose anybody using tools like Sonarworks or anything else, because even in, in, in a, in a well-treated room, um, unless you know exactly what you're doing, aka you're a professional acoustician, you've done this hundreds of times, you'll still end up with a result where the room and the low end will benefit from t uh, some touch up with uh, EQ. Yeah? Um, there's a little bit of EQ in this spot, a little bit of EQ right around here, just to fill in a couple of those voids. But here, more importantly, this is what it is with no EQ. And so all just from acoustic treatment of the room, I went from that to this with just treating the room. Yeah, looks great. Yeah, that's kind of what you would expect. Yeah, so exactly the kind of results that I would want to see at the very minimum uh, from um, doing a proper attempt at treating your room. That's what's important here. Um, and then this is with a little bit of EQ do that stuff. And so, you know, this is probably, I don't know what this is, maybe 4 dB there, uh, a similar move here, maybe 4 dB there um, to get it up. Only, only two moves. So, um, you know, that's a, a, a modest amount of EQ, certainly compared to some stuff that I've done, uh, you know, at when I was at Barefoot, there was, uh, I just hadn't quite, you know, got it this good with just the acoustic treatment. Um, had to do some more severe EQing in that place to make it work. So, I was more than happy to do this little bit. And oh, I guess, you know, you can see ultimately once, uh, once I um, was getting really close to the end, then I, I created a mark on the floor and had a string attached to my microphone so I could center it exactly on this little target on the floor. And <laughs> that's funny because that's exactly what I do. Yeah, so I have a little string in my in my kit, uh, my acoustic measurement kit. I have a little string that I hang off of the microphone so that I can both get the height right and also the position um, 
relative well, to the to the room so I can get that as close as possible to where it needs to be. There are some other ways you can still fine tune the exact position, but uh, that's that's how I do it. Line up the you know the distance between uh, of the microphone between left and right speakers very precisely, and um, and flatten this out. So so yeah so uh, so towards the end you know I I got the positioning of the microphone more precise so I wouldn't you know have to look at that cancellation which has nothing to do with really what I'm hearing uh, in the room. Okay, so what happened was um, I ended up bringing a bunch of tube traps with me um, from Barefoot. They were there, they were available. I knew I wanted to use uh, some of those in the room, particularly on the front side of the room. Um, and I saw some comments about this. I wanted to um, mention this, that um, people were saying that, you know, you can get rid of this cancellation in this sort of like 110 hertz range if you soften mount the speakers. Um, so there is a benefit there um, doing that. It can also extend the low frequency response of the speakers. There, there are some benefits to soffit mounting. The thing for me that I lose is that when you have the speakers sort of sitting out front of the wall, it creates this dead space on that wall all around the speakers. And that creates an opportunity for me to fill that space with low frequency absorbers, with bass traps. And so that's the reason that I wouldn't do a hard face bass trap because... Okay, so a bit confusing there. He says hard face bass trap. Obviously, if you put a hard face, AKA some sort of drywall, whatever wood on top of uh, some insulation material, then the low end won't be able, any sound will be able to enter that properly. So you, you're not actually, and you don't actually, you're not actually building a bass trap. You're building, building a flat surface that extends the front baffle, if you will, of the speaker. Yeah, so that's what soffit mounting really is in, in its classical approach. Yeah, um, but he's spot on with what he's about to say. You create a hard surface on the front side of the wall, and then you got to figure out how to remove that wall from reflecting low frequencies back in the in the room. You don't really have the space to do it anymore. On top of that, especially in a home studio, yeah, there is so much benefit in being able to adjust your speaker position, yeah, because that's the biggest lever you possibly have to do any type of changes to the sound in your room is just adjusting the speaker position. Yeah, so obviously, if you plan soffit mounted speakers, you're stuck with what you get. Yeah, and if it turns out that you actually want them slightly closer together, you have an issue. Yeah, or if you want to move them further out, you have an issue. Yeah, so I prefer to just stick to stand mounted speakers. That gives you the opportunity to refine your speaker position, even if it's just small changes. You'll find that that can make a huge difference to your ability to hear the soundstage and to actually mix um, records that translate properly. Yeah? So in my opinion, the, the flexibility that you gain from having your speakers on stands far outweighs the po potential benefits of reducing speaker boundary interference effects by soffit mounting speakers, at least in the home studio scenario. And so that's why, at least for me, um, I've, I've been preferring this, this approach of not soffit mounting, um, freestanding speakers. I use the voids that are created between the speakers and on the outside of the speaker to, you know, um, add a bunch of bass trapping, and it just helps with the performance um, overall for, w w in the room. You know, soffit mounting might help one thing; it might give me more low end. I don't need it in this room. It's everything was sort of designed to support the response of the speakers, um, and it actually ended up really doing that. Um, and so I would rather be able to just use that space to clean up the response of the whole room. So there's that uh, soffit. Soffit versus no soffit. That's at least uh, my take on it. So I started adding the tubes that I did have um, to the room. And I remember at Barefoot, um, there was one point when I first discovered tube traps, what I would do with them. And, um, and so the first, you know, I, I made these two like huge ones. They're 22 inches in diameter. They're massive. Um, I think the walls are either two inches or one and a half inches thick. And um, put them in the front quarters of the room, uh, just outside of the speakers, stuffed all the way in the corners. And the difference with and without those was so dramatic right out of the gate. It was like, whoa, oh my God, these things are actually doing something. 
And this was sort of the beginning of me really having some tools to be able to um, tune a room with just the acoustics of the room. You know, I was using fuzz measure, which I still use, really enjoy using that, and, and started using tube traps. It made all the difference. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. Amazing that this worked so well and that he had that experience. It won't be any different if you just use properly built bass traps. They don't have to be tube, tra tube traps. This is just him adding in a substantial amount of porous absorption. Yeah. And, uh, and then you get the result. It's that simple. Um, so here we go. I put two, those two, same two, um, 22 inch diameter tubes in the front corners next to the, next to those things. And, and look what happens. Granted, they're pretty big. Happens. So already, right out of the gate, we've got, you know, we've gained one, two, three dB here, probably something three or four dB here, here. Like all of these, you know, cancellation points are being diminished just with two tubes right up front. So that's like three or four dB of EQ that I don't have to do right there. And you want to minimize the amount of EQing you do as much as possible because EQing comes with huge compromises, obviously potentially headroom, yeah, robbing your speakers of headroom. If you boost into your speakers, you're stealing your, your speakers of headroom uh, or on the flip side, potential max volume or you're increasing the, the point at which the speakers start audibly distorting, you're, in, you're lowering that threshold. Um, and then obviously the the effect of uh, added latency by having DSP in the signal chain. Yeah, so you want to minimize EQ as much as possible, or rather, you want to do as much as you can with treatment first, and then just touch up only what is absolutely necessary with EQ at the end. Okay. So then, what do we have next? Okay. So then I did an experiment with the panels. I was really curious to see if it really made a difference, and I, I saw this. Uh, there was a demonstration of this with the, the setup with one panel behind a speaker. Um, if you watched the VPR episode, um, what it did, you know, having the, 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 the foam push tight so it's in contact with the metal versus being spread out. So just, just to be clear here, when he's talking about panels here, he's talking about these VPRs, these compound baffle absorbers. Yeah? So these are not standard acoustic panels or porous absorber bass traps. Yeah? These are these special... Uh, metal plate, steel plate plus insulation material panels that I think he built himself uh, based on the designs from Renz uh, from uh, this company here in Germany. I did that experiment with the whole room. I wanted to see how much of a difference that would make in the whole room. And so this, oh, okay, yeah, actually I did this sort of in the wrong order. Um, so this is with the panels loose in the room. So the metal is free floating in between the foam. And then this is with everything pushed tight. So they're making contact. And there is a tiny bit of difference here. Uh, let me move these out of the way. These numbers are actually sort of interfering with what we're being able to see. But you can see that the efficiency, it's a, those panels ability to grab some of these lower frequencies um, was definitely improved. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure how we took these measurements. This could very be very well be just an error in the in the like tolerances in the measurements. Yeah, I mean, and even if they aren't, to, if this isn't part of a kind of a measurement tolerance error, um, this is not a significant effect. Yeah, I mean, this considering how much he probably did, how many of these panels he put in the room. This is basically nothing, yeah. And, um, and then the question quickly arises: depending on how much effort and money he, he invested into getting these panels in there, and that's all you get, yeah. So um, just comes to show, yeah, some things are effective and some aren't. Um, by having the panels uh, loose and not having them in contact with the metal, uh, the metal. So it was further confirmation that 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 approach, I think, really does improve things, you know, by by a little bit. These are all sort of drops in the bucket. OK, so then this. OK, obviously, yeah, we don't we're not seeing the 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 kind of before version of the room here. We're just seeing the comparison between the two types of panels. Yeah, so my mistake here. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure just how much they did. One is um, what is this one called? Let's see. I gotta see my notes. Okay, so then now I put, um, I had a bunch of tubes from Barefoot. I put them all up 
front of the room. So there's the two big, huge 22 inch ones. I put ones in between the speakers on top of this. I have a little credenza that's holding some outboard gear that's at the front of the room. It's all the stuff that I don't really have to like be in the sweet spot to adjust. So it's more like compressors and stuff. The EQs I like to have closer to me so I can be in the sweet spot while I'm adjusting EQs. You'll be able to see this later when we get into some mixing, but I actually have a setup that I can pull right next to me. It has all of my EQs right here, just like having a console. It's just sitting there right next to me. Um, so, uh, so compressors are up there. So I, I put a bunch of tubes on top of this, uh, these, these racks, this little credenza over there. And so you can see this now, uh, what has happened. So even more improvement. And here's this thing, you know, uh, from the back wall. Really, really a huge improvement there. Uh, that's basically getting rid of that speaker boundary interference effect. Yeah, that's kind of, uh, you, you stop that reflection from happening and the dip basically disappears. Yeah? Um, almost totally eliminated that, just putting these tubes. And these tubes are anywhere from uh, 12 to 14, 16 inches in diameter. They're all sort of in that range. I had a variety of sizes. And the way the tubes work, um, they are wonderfully broadband. And so the diameter doesn't make a huge difference. Um, it does make a difference. So the larger diameter tubes will push and extend the low frequency absor absorption down into the lower range. But it's, it's not like a Hemholtz resonator where it's this really tuned specific thing. It's all very broadband because they're basically broadband panels <laughs> in a round shape, yeah? And increasing the, the diameter of the tube is the same as just increasing the depth of your panel, yeah? Um, makes them way, way easier to use. And so, um, so put a bunch more tubes up front. This improved, this improved a lot, this improved. Okay, so then at that point, I'm still sort of like in this idea of like, um, I don't want to fill my whole room with tubes. Um, they do take up a fair amount of space. I was really hoping that I was going to be able to get away with these VPR things, which are really only six or seven inches deep, you know, and be done with it. And so at this point, I wanted to try and do some stuff that I'd never tried before um, that can be a lot more efficient um, just as far as how it takes up space in the room. And so um, the first thing that I did was some Hemholtz stuff. So I started experimenting with Hemholtz. So I played around with that a bunch and, you know, put, I built one of them, put it in the back of the room, didn't make a big difference. Built another one, put it in the other corner, didn't make a, a, a huge difference. Or it would make it worse. Um, the, the, the cancellation would get worse. And so then we we're like, well, maybe we need more of them. So then we built like five or six of them and had them like two in the corners and then had a stack of them. And the way we had it was the closed ends were butted together and then the ports were at the top of the bottom, like right at the floor, right at the corner of the ceiling. That's really where you get a lot of the energy building up. We did that. Again, was not making it necessarily better. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, not doing what I was hoping it would do and was, you know, still kind of frustrating. So I wasn't really... These experiments with Helmholtz resonators, yeah, they can be very painful. Um, there's so many variables that you need to get right, um, apart from the ones that are obvious, so the tuning and the positioning. And so, um, yeah, I'm not surprised. Really getting a huge result. So then I got suspicious of the material I was using for the... Hemholtz resonators. So I was starting to feel like, you know, basically, you know, like a pipe organ. Um, that's essentially a, a Hemholtz resonator. It's a big cylinder. There's a port in it. You blow wind through it. It resonates at a very specific pitch. It actually creates a tone in the room. It's one of the things to be aware of with a Hemholtz resonator is that um, if you design one, you know, that's really, really efficient, it will ring in the room, you know, like you'll have music playing. And, turn off the music suddenly you hear this like mm, <laughs> sort of fade out in the room so you do have to dampen them a little bit and there's basically a trade -off. see that's the problem with all types of resonance absorbers is that you need to dampen them the properly this is a resonant system and if the damping isn't right you don't get the right kind of decay in this in this system and so that's one of the biggest issues with all types of resonance absorbers that you need to get the damping right and that is 
not easy to do. Off between dampening and efficiency. So if you add soft material on the interior of the Hemholtz resonator, and I put little pieces of foam on the cap that went on, the solid cap that went at one end, just to dampen it a little bit, um, you'll get rid of that ringing. And what ends up happening is it's not as sharp of a peak. It sort of broadens out a little bit. So it's not quite as efficient at canceling or absorbing the energy of a, that very specific frequency, um, but it won't ring and you get the benefit of it absorbing some stuff um, around it a little bit. Um, so a little bit of dampening is good so you don't have them ringing in the room. So I got suspicious about um, the material that I was using because, you know, those concrete forms are relatively thin, uh, you know, cardboard, hard like cardboard material and um, maybe only of an eighth of an inch thick. And when, when I was testing the resonance of them, you could feel the whole thing vibrating, you know? I thought, man, if this thing was really super solid, it probably would be creating more specific and more efficient resonance. So I chased it down. I found 12 inch PVC pipe. They actually make, make that. It's huge. It's, it's incredibly heavy. You have to buy it in these big long lengths. Um, it was a pain in the ass to work with because once you once I got it like I needed it in four foot sections um, and so I had to figure out how to cut this thing that was like 16 feet long I, it was a real adventure getting it from the place the supply place that got it in my truck with it sticking over the cab you know strapped down it's crazy amazing Eric that you went through all this trouble to make these to do these experiments yeah it's crazy um, uh, but got it back and then I had to figure out how to cut it um, so I think this is a good time to show some videos about building these Hemholtz things, testing them. You can get the idea. Um, so here's just like a variety of stages of the process, me working with all these different materials and testing them, all that stuff. So check this out. All right. So here's my latest, uh, cock mamie thing that I've got to figure out. Um, I'm still working on these Hemholtz. Helmholtz uh, resonators, and uh, you know I did a bunch of them with these concrete um, forming tubes, but they're I just I, my instincts are telling me there's just not quite enough mass there um, to really uh, create a solid resonant chamber that's going to be really efficient. I think uh, efficiency is being lost in the fact that the whole thing vibrates a lot. So. He's probably completely right. Yeah, that's one of the issues with all types of resonance absorbers. Like the, they need to be extremely heavy. The, 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 you don't want any of the structure of the thing actually resonating, actually vibrating, um, because that will create unwanted resonance in the system. Yeah, and who knows what that does? I managed to find um, that they make, you know, twelve-inch diameter PVC pipe. Um, I found a place that sells it. Um, it's this delightful sort of turquoise color here. So I've come up with a way to sort of test these things. Um, uh, you know, this thing is supposed to be tuned down around like 41, 42, 43. That's the issue that I'm having. It's the second order of the length of this room. <clears throat> so initially when we were tuning these things, I would just hold it in front of the speaker and I could feel it when it would really activate and start vibrating. And then, I, you know, I started realizing like, man, it's probably not supposed to do that. So now what we have is this little piece of tissue um, hanging over the hole. And so you can really see when the air is going in and out of there, um, when the tissue really starts moving, that's, you know, uh, what this thing is tuned to. You know, so when I turn it off, you can see the tissue just sitting there um okay so so there it is let me start this up again yeah so you can see it freaking out there and so this tube ended up being uh just slightly higher right at 43.5 hertz <coughs> and you can watch what happens when i move up paper stops moving so that's at 60 right now. So there we are, right? 43. I'm going to go below that. Yeah, so we're really, really down there. 
the kind of experiments you have to go through to tune these things. I mean, at this point, he's just he's just figured out what resonance he's actually tuned these things to in practice, right? But yeah, this is this, this is uh, oftentimes what it takes and more. And it doesn't really move as much there. So it's pretty clear that 43 is where this thing is tuned. Uh, the really hard PVC um, Hamholtz resonator really did not make a huge difference. It wasn't enough of a difference to uh, justify the hassle and cost of working with that material. So that's usually the result that you get to, yeah? uh, more often than not. And that's one of the reasons why I always say just stick to porous absorption. Yeah? Oh, I abandoned that material and didn't didn't work with it anymore. And Really, what ended up happening, and, and so this is another part of this whole thing that is very, very complex. So there were times where I would add absorptive material to the back of the room, and the cancellation would get worse. And that's because what's happening is there's a collision of these two resonances in my sitting position, uh, my listening position in the room, that are causing this cancellation. And it's because they are phased opposite each other. And if you've ever done like a null, you know, a, a phase nulling type experiment, um, when, the, when the volumes are super equal, then you get this really, really dramatic, you know, cancellation. But if one is a little bit quieter than the other, then it doesn't cancel quite as much. And so, you know, what could be happening um, in this case is, let's say this is the really low frequency, this is like the 41 hertz and this is my 57 hertz, and I put absorption in the back of the room that decreases the amount of resonance in the energy in the room at my listening position, but it's actually bringing it closer in volume to this one, and so it cancels more. And so I think that's what was happening in the back of the room. Um, Something else that could be happening is that it's actually removing run one problem, uh, which reveals another one, right? So oftentimes, these uh, problems act against each other and they actually sort of cancel each other out in a way. Yeah, So that might also be happening. Um, I mean, this interaction between resonances only happens if they are the frequencies are fairly close together. Yeah, So I'm not entirely sure which ones he's referring to right now, but uh, if they're far enough apart, they can't really interact yeah? because the frequencies are too different. Yeah, So they have to be fairly close together for that interaction, ideally right on top of each other. Um, and so I'm slightly skeptical of his conclusion here, but there are so many things that go on in these rooms. Uh, this is still, acoustically speaking, a small room. Yeah? So uh, in small room acoustics, there is so much going on. Um, and it's, sometimes it can be very, very hard to diagnose exactly what an issue is because you're usually de dealing with a lot of issues piled on top of each other that are in many ways interacting. And so just addressing one of them uh, might reveal a different one. You might think that you're addressing one, but you're actually addressing something else as well without knowing it. So um, it's good. it can be hard. So that's kind of the process that we're seeing here. Yeah. So I'm I, I'm not going to say uh, what exactly is going on because I don't know. Um, but uh, I think there are potentially other causes for what he's seeing. When I was putting stuff back there, and it's like fuck, it's getting worse. You know, we even tried putting a bunch back there to see if we could get past that point where it would, you know, go past this point and get lower and lower to the point where we're actually seeing an improvement. You know, past the the, the real null point and get lower than that. Um, but I, I could never get there uh, with the Hemholtz resonators. So. Um, I screwed around with those things forever and ever and ever and ever and ever um, and just could not um, get something on the back wall that was really, you know, making a significant improvement. Um, so with the realization that um, this was an interaction between this 40-ish hertz at the back of the room and 57-ish hertz between the floor and the ceiling, I decided, fuck it, let's go the other way. I'm going to go after the, the 57 hertz and see if I can get something to work there. And so for that, I needed to make a bigger hole um, in, in uh, my Hemholtz resonator to raise this frequency. So the bigger the hole, the higher the frequency. So I, it turned out, you know, when I started playing with stuff here, that a, a, like a 9-inch hole gave me my 57 hertz. Um, so 
I cut cut a nine inch hole in there. Um, this time I just I used a template and just used like a jigsaw, you know, because I didn't have like a hole cutting saw that would do that size. A jigsaw worked fine as long as you're close. You know, it doesn't have to be perfectly uh, round in there. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle. Um, and uh, you know, it's really just sort of like the size of the opening um, that that matters. The total size area of the opening that matters. So you know, I got it super close. Um, I tested it. Um, you could see in those videos, you know, how I was testing it with a little sheet of um, uh, toilet paper. That ended up being really, really helpful uh, to figure out, you know, really where these things are resonating, and I could adjust either the size of the hole or the length if I was going that way. But really. Ultimately, using the standard four foot size um, and, uh, you know, adjusting the size of the hole got me there. And then, you know, I didn't need to add any length because if you add length to the hole, like if you put in a port um, with, a, with length to it, that just makes the frequency even lower. And that my problem was trying to get it higher um, with the volume of airspace that I wanted in the in the resonator. So um, so then. I had those and I started, I, I set up a, a thing where I had 50 hertz coming out of the speakers, a microphone right here, and just a decibel meter so I could see the level um, that was being picked up by the microphone in my listening position. And so you could see a huge cancellation right there. If I went to frequencies around it, the level came up a bunch. But, you know, right in this position, it was very low. And I actually, it was a little confusing numerically because, um, the it was showing as a negative number or no what uh i remember it got confusing at, at a certain point and so um so then i set up an actual you know virtual vu meter so i could see the needle go up and down you know and in this instance i want to see the needle go up i want to have more 50 hertz in my listening position as i'm moving around the room with this thing because when i was looking at the number it got confusing it was like wait a minute is this a negative number is this a positive number if it's a negative number i want the number to get lower in value or you know it was it got confusing so so with a with a vu it was very easy for me to go oh that's higher that's what i want um not not trying to do math while i'm walking around the room with this fucking thing so um uh, so I found a really magical place in the room, and it was basically right in, it was, it's right at that, like, quarter-length position in the room, and there was this spot where when I held it up to the ceiling, I could just feel the tube go, and start just vibrating like crazy, resonating like crazy, and you'd see the VU meter go, whoop, and come up, you know? And so the, it happened in both upper corners of the room right up here and so that was my success with Hemholtz resonators and so Sweet. let's pull up this graph it's super interesting so every time um, you know because like in between a lot of these different tests I'd stop it would be the next day I'd have to build a bunch of crap, you know, like build some hemo, go and get materials, whatever. It'd be days would pass, and then I'd start up again. I'd put the microphone back in. And even when you move the microphone just a tiny bit, you get a very different thing. So I'd have a new, I'd have to create a new benchmark each time. So I'm not comparing to, because this was where I kind of left off. This was, you know, um, all the tubes up front, uh, and I was right here. And so then I came back the next day, and I was, and I discovered this whole thing, and I, I, I captured the difference that these Hemholtz things were making. Um, and so I did a new benchmark. This is without the Hemholtz resonators um, up in these, you know, corners in the ceiling right here. I'll see if I can. Yeah, you'll see a picture of them later when I show a video that shows the end result of this room, which is kind of crazy looking. Um, okay, now check this out. Bum, ba -dum. Look what it did. This is so cool. Um, so another pretty substantial gain here. This is almost here. So this is like one, two, three, four, almost four dB of reduction in this cancellation here. Here's the big thing for anybody that's looking lower in the screen. Look at that. Oh my goodness. That is a huge difference. It cut the decay time at this in this 60 hertz range in half that is a huge difference there was nothing else that i put in this room that did that's true yeah that's uh, really great um and i'm surprised that we're only looking at uh, any type of time related um metric 
uh, now because um, the, t the time response is arguably even more important than the frequency response because the frequency response is just a result of getting the time response right. Yeah, so obviously in real life, everything just happens in time. The frequency domain doesn't exist in reality. Yeah, so um, it's, uh, uh, the frequency response is a direct consequence of fixing the time response. Yeah, so um, that's why I like to look at way more than, or I glance over frequency to see what, what results I'm getting, but it's in the time response where I actually analyze the problem. Yeah, so, um, uh, but yeah, great result. Anything like that. And so that's, that's really the benefit of the Helmholtz thing. Because, you know, relative to the, the volume of the room, you know, these are just two tubes that each have a volume of whatever that was, three something square feet. What, what was this? Yeah, 3.14 square feet of, is the volume. And so it's a total of, you know, whatever, six feet and change. Uh, of air volume that you're taking up in the room and it's it's having this much effect on this frequency range that is huge so if you do get the hemholtz resonators right and you find them in the right get the right position at the right frequency in the room you can get this dramatic result with them um, and so it took me days to figure this out <laughs> It took so long. Oh my God. I built so many of these things and tried so many different variations, so many frequencies, so many positions in the room. I I'm so sorry to hear that. I mean, and that's what it takes. The Obviously, the the not so funny reality is that you can get the exact same thing with just a bunch of porous absorption. Yeah. And it's so much easier to do and it takes way less time. I screwed around with them forever and finally got something that was... <laughs> <laughs> beneficial you know so there you go um, so then uh, I had done that there but still the back of the room I wasn't having any luck um, with Hemholtz resonators in the back of the room so I went down a different road I went down the limp mass absorber mo road <laughs> <laughs> I'd heard about them um, the one that I found that I thought was kind of the coolest let me see if I can pull this up here yeah, really cool document um, from this company, Buzz Audio. They are cool folks. Apparently, the the overall dimension of the thing doesn't really matter. Like, if it's um, it's really this distance, dimension D, that does it, um, that determines the frequency, and uh, and so the the height and width dimension doesn't really matter. The bigger it is, the more it'll absorb. So, I built two big ass ones. <laughs> um, I got. I mean. In terms of functionality, yes, but right, the very basic equation of acoustics is absorption coefficient times surface area covered, right? And so with uh, with the the tuning, you affect the absorption coefficient, and then the surface area is what you need to get right in order to say how much of that particular frequency, let's say, of the frequencies you're absorbing, right? So obviously, a bigger surface area is gonna have a bigger effect, like you just said. Yeah? So the, the overall dimensions do matter, uh, but not in terms of tuning the thing. Here's the result. So here's another one of these rounds where this was my baseline measurement. Um, you know, so I'll basically um, have um, uh, a status in the room. This, this is theoretically the point where I have um, basically only tubes all in the front of the room. Tons of tube traps in the front of the room. And now I'm trying to deal with you know they took took care of this thing pretty well and then now i'm just dealing with this and this trying to deal with it with the back of the room and so this is no limp mass absorber and then this is with one limp mass absorber and this is with limp mass absorbers in the two back corners of the room not a huge difference there you know i mean we've got maybe one, two, three, yeah, three dB, something like that, you know. And here, it made it worse. Um, and so it was a little bit of a trade-off there. Uh, so we did get a little bit of improvement here, but then in the wrong direction there. And so those things, I just decided, like, these are a fucking pain in the ass to build. They're big and heavy and, you know, 
I, they're just, I don't know if these are going to get me there. Um, they may be too specific um, to this frequency, uh, causing problems here. I don't want to build a whole wall of these things. That just doesn't, it's not feeling like the way to go. It looks to me like these things are basically don't work. Yeah. The, there are, again, so many variables that go into getting these right. And so these are, they just, they're, they're not actually absorbing properly. Yeah. For whatever reason. So unfortunately, that happens a lot. So at this point, I'm like, screw it. At this point, why don't I just go back to using um, tube traps? I know those will do something back there. And um, the material is available. It's not wildly expensive, you know, compared to some of these, uh, some of the stuff that you get into to do this. Um, you know, it, I, th I think it's very reasonably priced, you know, for building these things. Um, so I decided, fuck it, I'm going to build a bunch of huge ass tubes back there. These ones were going to be 20 inches in diameter, just slightly smaller than the ones up there, two inch thick walls. And I'm just going to fill that whole back wall with nine foot tall tube tracks and see if that makes a difference. Damn it. <laughs> you know, like something's got to work, you know? And so, um, so that was the next experiment. And, uh, so here, here we go. Here's small resonant panels. And then this is with the tube traps on the back wall. Look at that. Yay. It's doing stuff. Yay. Oh my God. I was getting so frustrated um, along the way, trying all these things that were really supposed to be doing stuff, um, but didn't. And man, this one was huge huge. I was so pleased uh, to see that because um, I was very concerned about this. this. It would be very hard to, you know, navigate EQing a snare drum with that cancellation going on. So that was a relief. This is totally in a usable range now. Um, so, uh, so now um, there are some other variables about the tubes that um, I had never really had an opportunity to test before. And that's really what this whole build, this whole studio thing has been about. Is I, you know, I had the time, I had the resources to fuck around and really learn some shit. And, um, and so... Amazing. I want to just for myself know, like, do you have to have it closed at each end? Do you need a cap on both sides? What if I leave the paper on? What if I take the paper off? You know, do I need to have a hard surface on the front of this or not? Like... What, how does all of this stuff affect this? I don't know if that the inside chamber is going to create any resonance at all. Um, the ones that have the paper on the outside, so air can't pass through the walls of it, um, might have a little bit more of a resonance to it, but that gets dampened a lot, obviously, by the fiberglass on the inside. So um, I did try and actually put one of these down and use my little toilet paper trick for um, seeing if there was a resonance there, and it, there was no real clear resonance uh, to this thing. <laughs> I think this is a myth that these things and that these things can resonate. Yeah, um, it's just insulation material. Paper is way too thin to hold uh, to to kind of hold any energy at the low frequencies that we're talking about. They just pass through. Um, yeah, basically, like I said at the at the beginning of this video, for me these are just porous absorbers in a different shape. All right, we have a result. I put all the little caps on there. Had to weigh one down. It was a little warped. Um, the other ones sat on there good enough no real appreciable difference there um i don't know if you can see this graph not a big difference time to take the paper off okay let's see what happened here oh my goodness yeah no real significant difference like i said these are just porous absorbers they don't do anything special and maybe a tiny tiny difference here I mean, really minuscule. They're showing like a much longer decay time with this, which potentially problematic. So you always got to take the reverb time measurement with a grain of salt. Yeah. So that's not a direct um, representation of the decay. You need to look at the impulse response if you want to read that off. And so if it, if, it, if it turns the impulse response measurement into a RT60 value, there might be some mistakes there in the automatic calculation. And that's why I don't trust RT60 measurements at all. I just look at the impulse response because yeah? that's the only way you can actually check out what's going on. Yeah, this might actually be better with the paper on. 
Mm, damn it. Okay, so here's the result right here. It's not a, not a huge difference. Um, that's a that's a that could be down to just like error in the measurement. There's, I don't see a difference here. You know, maybe there's a little bit, you know, uh, of uh, energy loss here, not major. I mean, you can see definitely it's lengthening the reverb time, but you know, the scale of this right now, this is 0.2, so this is like, you know, 0.05 difference in the length of reverb time, uh, you know, in this frequency range. You can definitely see the sort of reflectiveness of the paper in the room up in the high frequencies, so you can see that lengthening a little bit. Uh, yep, that's true. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, maybe um, it was a little better uh, in the low frequencies with the paper, uh, maybe, I don't know. My next experiment was I wonder if you put a hard surface on the face of these things, because I've seen some of the tubes made that way, and they sometimes they'll call them abfusers, so they absorb in some frequency ranges, but then diffuse in other frequency ranges, and that's what these would do. If you have a hard, you know, surface on the front of this cylinder, you know, it's this, you know, uh, it's not a flat surface, and so uh, reflections would get bounced off in all different directions and different timings and stuff, and so it can function as a diffuser. So here's that result. Again, not a significant difference, and you know, some places you're kind of trading one for the other, um, and again, you see the huge difference in the high frequency range just because there's a hard surface that's now facing back into the room, and so all of these higher frequencies get you know, um, reflected back more in the room. It length, lengthens the reverb time in the room in that range. Okay. I'm going to say it's, it brings back the original reverb time because obviously he had absorbed it before. And so now that absorption is covered up. And so we're now getting back to what the original reverb time was. Yeah, you can't actually lengthen the reverb time artificially with diffusion. Okay, so then, um, uh, so I decided, yeah, that's probably not worth it. It's not really making a substantial difference, you know, down in this world. Um, and this, I'm probably better off not having all of that. Uh, you know, I feel like it's it's probably better to have all of the decays a little bit more uniform across the frequency spectrum. I don't want to have more, you know, a greater degree of um, decay time here. Uh, and so, now, um, I... I would say that's a taste thing. Yeah, some people like their rooms to sound more lively than others. I think it's a taste thing. So then, now we're, we're starting to EQ some stuff. I'm tinkering around with that and, and ultimately ended up here. And so this is the, compare, the final comparison between with and without the EQ. And that's where I ended up. So that was the comparison between this and here. So this is the final end thing. With EQ, sorry, I sort of breezed through all of this stuff. It, there was, there was really too much um, throwing things around the room to really document every single stage of that. I tried to as much as I could to like where tubes were good or bad or whatever. But I mean, I was basically there's, you know, I have dozens of these things, and I was I was just trying them all over the place, um, you know, to see where it was beneficial and where it wasn't. Um, so the the end result is. I, I still, still feel very strongly that the tubes are a huge part of it. Okay, super interesting stuff there, right? I mean, he went through so much stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it here. Um, obviously, again, if you want to watch the original video, I've linked it down in the description. Um, but yeah, super interesting to see the, the results from all these experiments. And in many ways, like I said, they confirm what I keep repeating here. Some things are... Uh, very tricky to get right, like the resonance absorbers. In fact, a lot of times you you just don't know why they don't work because there are so many different variables uh, apart from just the tuning and the positioning that you need to get right for them to work. And um, and then to see just how well porous absorption actually works. In this case, these tube traps. I got to say, I think if you just use standard porous absorption, just fill the entire depth, you would have probably gotten even better results yeah, with these tube traps. He said that the, the actual uh, insulation material is just two inches thick. And so there's potentiality for problems there. Um, so uh, in my opinion, it's a much better approach to just stick to just 
standard panels, deep, make them deep enough, and you'll get the same, if not better, results. Um, but yeah, super interesting to follow along in his journey. So again, thanks, Eric, for putting all this up there, putting all that effort into it. And um, yeah, thanks for joining me on this reaction video. Um, and let's get back to learning to trust our ears, having fun making music in the studio. That's what it's all about. I'll see you in the next video.